And so, oh, and before I get, because. So, what are some of the, I, first of all, I just really thought this was a cool looking picture. It looked better before it became digitized on the iPad, but what are some of the other possible roles for the mitochondria other than the electron transfer chain and oxidative phosphorylation? What else, what other uses do they have? Someone said something, I whenever the music was playing, is apoptosis this is one. Mitochondria is responsible as one of the one of the ways for apoptosis to occur. There's at least two other ones. What's what's the nether we've actually briefly mentioned it last class. And then the third one we have mentioned at all so far. What are some other possible roles of mitochondria? Think about, you know, the bear that you had been running from. It's now tired and it's gonna go hibernate. What does it mitochondria do? It's mitochondria do, typically. Same thing for babies. Some of us probably wish that we still had this and this would be a possibility. Keep your metabolism. Okay. But what does it, I mean, and how? What do you mean? It, yes, it's thermogenesis, that's a scientific term. And then the third one actually has steroids, and it's steroid synthesis. Okay. So thermogenesis, steroid synthesis, and apoptosis. <clears throat> and after today's class, make sure you send me an email if you haven't already done so to ask me to put this PowerPoint on my fire. There's, there aren't a lot of slides to this one. Okay. So first step is thermogenesis, and what is literally what does that mean? What? Generation, Generation of heat. Yes. Where does it occur? And don't just tell me mitochondria, but specifically what tissue does it occur? Bears have it, hibernating animals have it, lots of it. What kind? Brown. Yes. Bear, babies have it. Baby bears have it. Okay, yeah, brown adipose tissue. <clears throat> and do you know why it's called brown? What? Brown? It, do, it does look darker than what's what's the other type of adipose tissue? Like it has like multiple drops in it, right? Well, what's the other? There's brown adipose tissue, and then there is yellow, yellow, yellow or sometimes they look like yellow, sometimes white. they call it white. Mm -hmm. It's not that much light color. All right. Oh, unicellular, right? What? <laughs> well, that was. <laughs> so, but one of the reasons why it's going to appear darker actually has to do with the capillaries that's involved. Okay. There are many more capillaries that go to the brown adipose tissue than the white adipose tissue. <clears throat> and some would also argue the fact that there's just lots of mitochondria, especially as compared to the white adipose tissue has very little. <clears throat> and this point right here, the Christi transverse much of the mitochondrion, what does that mean? Like, what is that indicating? What is the Christi? Yes. So, if you draw our little handy dandy mitochondrion, there's the outer membrane. This is not drawn to scale. So then how would we attempt to draw the Christi transversing mesh of the mitochondrion? You know, normally, don't do this, but normally whenever I draw it, it looks something like this. You know, whoop. <laughs> okay. For the inner membrane, let me hit undo. Yeah, it's gonna look. Which I'm not gonna do. Hopefully, you get the idea. Uh, don't hate me for my beautiful drawings. Okay, but <laughs> we get something more like that. Okay, which what is the importance of that right there? Surface area. It does. It greatly increases the surface area. What but what especially is happening in the Christie? So to speak, it's electron transport chain. Yes, 
Okay, because right here we don't do a lot of oxidative phosphorylation here. In particular, it's because of what we'll talk about in small groups, is the thermogenin protein. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so, oh, and by the way, I forgot to, uh, the old, the old um, books, a lot of times we'll call it BAT versus WAT, it's like for the brown, which is white. The, the one big, big difference is this whole idea of thermogenin. Thermogenin is a protein that is a pore. Okay. And so, it is unique to the brown adipose tissue. So the idea here is, you know, normally, which this doesn't do very well, but normally we have the electron transport chain that's occurring, pumping the protons out into the intermembrane space. Oops, that's the intermembrane space on this one. They drew it really, really tiny. The intermembrane space. But then we would have it usually go through the ATP synthase in order to make ATP. But since there's a thermogenin there, it makes a channel. So just like the Duke football game, at least back in the 90s, is just, you know, why go through the turnstile when you've got literally an open door here for the protons to pump right on through? So all of the protons go out just like normal, but then they just go through the open space. And then what happens is you don't make ATP, but this generates heat, okay? So it helps keep them warm. It's also called the uncoupling protein. <clears throat> Since it's uncoupling oxidative phosphorylation from the electron transport chain. Okay. Any questions so far? Just take world today. All right. Then we'll just talk about steroid synthesis. Like this is always like the like and the rest of the story kind of thing. This part of the chapter, you could always take these and go in much more detail with each of these. We'll talk a little bit about steroid synthesis later on if we have time. Um, but. And I didn't plan it. Actually, I really didn't plan it for those in enzymology. But we just covered some of this, like oxygenesis, like just this last hour. <clears throat> okay. But the mitochondria also is a site for certain types of steroid synthesis to occur. Okay. This is especially true for the adrenal glands. Which, where are the adrenal glands? Yes, kind of look like a little, dun I shouldn't say dunce hat, but kind of a little... Thing that says on top of the kidney, all right, and the gonads, which are reproductive organs. Okay, to make sure you know, recognize some of the terminology from A and P. All right, and so they are going to produce the sex hormones. So we're talking about the estrogens, the androgens, vitamin D, the glucocorticoid, glucocorticoids, and the mineral corticoids. Okay. And in particular, they're gonna, they utilize what's called the P450 family. And this is really like a super family <clears throat> for cytochrome P450s. And these are oxygenases. And I know we actually have enough time. That, so on your little handy dandy, just in case you didn't get that there, um, it is called cytochrome P450s. And technically, it's not a single enzyme. There's a, there's a lot of enzymes. That was just in case you didn't. <clears throat> okay. All right. Any questions before we go on to the final one, which I wanted to put a little bit more time into because it's for apoptosis, which in of itself is a way is you can you can think of it as being a metabolic. <clears throat> Because what is apoptosis? Cell death. Cell death. In fact, it's programmed cell death. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and list of enzymes. 
we have oxygenases. And we're gonna, this is the first time I do believe that we've talked about oxygenases here. <clears throat> Normally, I'm really rushed by the time that we get to the end of chapter 19, and so we don't have time to go over the different types of oxygenases until the next, until the next time that it comes across one of the chapters. Oxygenases are not to be confused with. What sounds a lot like oxygenase? Oxidase. Okay, which is, so we have, so for example, cytochrome C oxidase. What kind of reactions did oxidases do? What? Not necessarily removing the proton, but broad general class, like what are they? Redox. Right, we're talking about these are oxidoreductases. Which technically, oh well, I'll get to in just a moment. That's why it's cytochrome C oxidase, which would mean, typically that means it's going to oxidize cytochrome C versus cytochrome C reductase when reducing it. Then we have some that they just call oxidoreductase, which technically that's the, the best term to use, so oxidoreductase. That's one of the big super family, like, you know, names from the enzyme um, commission classification. Okay, they do redox reactions. Okay, they are also related to dehydrogenases. Which dehydrogenases do what kind of reactions? It's just a very specific type of oxidase. What do they utilize? You're right, they use things like NAD or its derivatives or FAD and its derivatives. All right. So, what is an oxygenase? What kind, like that broad class of reactions, like remember there are ligases and transferases and lyases and I'm trying to think of oxidoreductases. So, what kind of reaction do you suppose an oxygenase is going to do? Well, broad class, what kind? It does have to do with oxygen. So what are they going to do? What class of reactions, what kind of reactions are they going to do? They also do redox reactions. So we had to do a compare and contrast. They also do redox. So technically, it is a type of oxidoreductase. It's just very specific. Okay, so they use something special. In order to be an oxygenase, what do you suppose that they're going to use in their reactions? Don't overthink it. Oxygen, and in particular, we're talking about elemental oxygen. Remember, elemental oxygen is diatomic, so it's O2. Oxidases, in general, and dehydrogenases, also, they do not utilize O2. Now, more importantly, so O2, there are two classes of oxygenases. And they're very important. One are called monooxygenase. Versus, does anyone want to think what, instead of mono, what there would be? Oh, that, that's a good guess, but it's dye. It'll make sense in just a moment. Because mono means one and di means two. Okay. <clears throat> so these are enzymes that do redox reactions. They utilize elemental oxygen, O2, for doing the oxidation reaction. So what do you suppose the difference is between mono oxygenase and di oxygenase? Just multiple steps. No. But that is a good guess. Yeah, oh, you're getting really close now. Okay, so for monooxygenase, one oxygen, that's not a zero, one oxygen atom is incorporated into the product. Whereas if it's a dioxygenase, what do you suppose is going to happen? 
both oxygen atoms are incorporated. Into the product. Oh, that's, that's supposed to be P, not a G. Okay, so many times we'll see like a monooxygenase. Cytochrome P450s with monooxygenases are ways that our body can actually take like an alkane or alkene and turn it to an alcohol. Like it adds an oxygen to make an alcohol. Dioxygenases would like make an ester or would like, make it diol where it's literally putting two oxygens in there. Okay. Whereas if you think back to organic chemistry, it's kind of hard. Remember, alkanes are really inert. They don't, they don't do much of anything. And so in order to make the alkanes or an alkene um, be reactive, a lot of times where you had to do like free re you had to do free radical halogenation and you had to do this and do that to make a good leaving group and then you had to have it, something that would add the alcohol in. Oh, there's lots of stuff that well cytochrome P four fifties actually do that in, instead. Obviously we don't want to have free radical halogenation occurring in our body. That would be really, really bad. And so we utilize some of these cytochromes and these oxygenases to do that instead. And so this is one way that we have to put like alcohols or ketones and esters and stuff like that into what would otherwise be an alkane or an alkene group, okay? Which is really important if you ever look at the structure. I don't have the structure, I believe. Yeah, I don't have the structure of the steroids like estrogens and cholesterol and cholesterol derivatives, but they do have, you know, alcohols and ketones and things like that that's added. And so these oxygenases are used to do that. They're also used, by the way, to make prostaglandins like quisinoids and thromboxanes, which we cover later on in semester time permitting. Are there any questions? This is just another example of an enzyme to add to things like polymerases and synthase versus synthetase, kinase, phosphorylase, and phosphatase. Now we have the oxygen, the, the oxidative reductases. So we have oxidase, reductase, oxidative reductase, dehydrogenase. And then oxygenases. Ooh, that was a mouthful. Any questions? And then, just in case you didn't get that, come on. Oh, it's not gonna. <laughs> well, and I, I'm gonna break this. Let me before I tell you something. True. The little figure on the right, I'm going to break it down to where you can see it a little, a little better. Okay, so don't, don't try to write it all down. All right. Just like it says in Ecclesiastes, you know, there's a season for all things. Time to live, time to die. Take the generation. Okay, so you have to do, and there are times that the cell is going to die or need to die for the good of the organism. Because what happens if it doesn't? What's one of the possible? Tumors. You get tumors, yeah, bad things happen when stuff goes awry. This is not the only way for cell death to occur, but it is a major, major way. So don't confuse apoptosis with paraptosis, which has to do with iron, um, or you know, some type of macrophagocytic response rate or something like that. <clears throat> All right. So, how does this occur? This is actually where, I briefly mentioned at one time, a couple, I think it was a couple of class periods back, where cytochrome C is kind of at a, is only involved in another pathway. Its primary normal um, role has to do with the electron transport chain, but it does play a role, and it plays a role in particular in apoptosis. And so, this is what's gonna happen. So, let's say something goes wrong. Okay, so normally, normally we just have, you know, the electron transport chain is going on, you know, just fine. So the protons are being pumped across here. Then it goes back through the ATP synthase, making ATP, life is good. You know, we've got this citric acid cycle going on. We've got beta, oxi well, beta oxidation and everything going on as well. And, you know, like I said, life is good. Well, what happens is, let's say that you have some type of stressor. It could be lots of different signals. But one of the things that can happen is if you have any type of um, 
where the integrity of the membrane starts to break down. So for example, you have what's called the permeability transition pore. But any type that there's a breakdown of that membrane, cytochrome C will be able to leak out. Because you have quite a bit of cytochrome C here. But it's supposed to be in the intermembrane space. Remember, it's not a part of the, the inner membrane, and it's not a part of the outer membrane. So if the permeability transition pore complex or if something was to cause the mitochondria's integrity to be compromised, cytochrome C can actually leak out, okay? One thing I want to point out, because I think the book still calls it this, but the PTPC is this big, um, oh, whatchamacallit, permeability, permeability transition pore complex. So it causes it to form pores. <clears throat> so now we've got cytochrome C where we shouldn't have cytochrome C. It's now in the cytosol. It leaked. Ooh, what happened there? Once it leaks into the cytosol, it can hook up with APAF1. You know, cell biologists love giving everything an acronym, but it does make sense. It's called apoptosis protease activating factor number one, so APAF1. Okay. <clears throat> this is going to cause, or this is going to initiate the formation of what's called the apoptosome. They also, biologists really like zomes, you know, like chromosome, replosome, um, respirosome, all that kind of stuff. There's the apoptosome. But yeah, this is what a PAF1 typically would look like. You know, it's kind of um, folded up, so to speak. It does require ATP, and then it pops out once, the, once it binds the cytochrome C to form this apoptosome. So it's this huge, huge complex. It binds something called Procaspase 9. That pro, once again, just means it's a precursor form. We've seen pro before. Um, we've seen, with it, for example, with insulin. There's the pre, technically insulin, we have pre pro insulin, since pro insulin is pre insulin. <clears throat> so Procaspase 9 is a monomeric. It's an active, it's the precursor form. Caspase, the apoptosome binds it and will dimerize it and will turn it into what's called caspase. Caspase will initiate the caspase pathway. <clears throat> once it's active. Okay. Caspase 9 then activates Procaspase 3 and Procaspase 7 in order to become Caspase 3 and Caspase 7. <clears throat> Come on now. And it's these caspases that actually will cause the cell to die, for cell death to occur. So once again, the initial event has to be something has to lead to the permeability of the outer membranes of the mitochondria in order for it to be mitochondria-associated caspase programmed cell death. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. So it's the, um, the purple things that activate the caspase, and it's going to the caspase three. Purple things. 
Cast base nine, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, cast base nine, whenever it becomes activated by forming the dimers, it's what's going to turn the procast base three and procast base seven into the mature form, the active form. Uh -huh. And then, so what does the term proteolytic mean? Lytic in general means cutting, and so this means that it's cut part of the protein. The protein, so there's a cast base in of itself with some type of protein. <clears throat> right. Any other questions? Awesome.